everyone. My name is Christina Malian, and I am from the Malian Law Firm. As you know, or most of you know, I do personal injury cases, which are your accident cases, and I do simple estate planning. Today's program is very unique and special and very important given COVID-19. Tonight, I have with us Ala Tanina from the Tanina Law Firm, located in Los Angeles. However, Ala has a I believe dual license from New York City all the way to California. And I welcome her. She's a tax attorney, estate planning attorney, bankruptcy attorney, and uh, asset protection attorney. With that said, hi, Ala, how are you? Hi, Christina, I'm good, thank you. Great to thank have you. Thank you for the opportunity, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. I know we had some technical difficulties of going online and live. Hopefully we'll um, do a quick program for our viewers and maybe reschedule another live session. Now a little background on Allah. Allah's not your ordinary attorney and she comes with nearly two decades of an experience. She has worked for Wall Street and from Wall Street after 9-11, the unfortunate event, she had to move back to Los Angeles where she was a senior associate counsel for KPMG. Having the tax benefit, having the tax knowledge, and being a tax attorney, she decided to launch her practice and um, practice in the Los Angeles community to provide all of the consumers the help they need. And with her background, um, she is going to provide us great knowledge on the PPP loans, very good insight for business owners, self-employees. We're going to talk a little bit about the stimulus check and then move on to taxes. I know um, it's an important topic, especially during this time, and we have a lot of questions. I do want to make a disclaimer out there. As you know, this is for informational purposes only. It's not to be construed as attorney-client privilege. If you have specific questions, you can reach Allah's office, and I'll provide her contact information below. And you could always reach my office, and I will direct you to the appropriate attorney. With that said, let's get to it. Allah. Some hot topics are changing, right? Like we understand that there's a lot of changes and the CARES Act came about and a lot of programs came into place. Let's talk about PPP. So rumor had it, or a lot of people think that PPP was or is only for those who have payroll. But you told me otherwise. Right, so originally it was designed for businesses that have payroll and when you go to the bank and ask for a PPP application, the first question is, what is your payroll? You have to provide forms 940, 941, which basically meant that the program is designed for businesses that have payroll. So the first round of PPP checks were issued only to the businesses that had payroll. Okay. At some point at the end of the April, the Treasury realized that we have some self-employed people, we have partnerships, LLC, so they launched a second round of PPP applications. And that program was specifically designed for self-employed people that are filing Schedule C, Form 1040, for partnerships, LLCs, and LLPs. Those are the businesses that are filing Form 1065. That's a partnership tax return. That's amazing because most of us, like you said, don't, don't fall under the payroll category and we either are self-employed or um, don't get, pass off payroll. So this is great news for the consumers who are business owners. Now, with that said, what is it that they're going to look at? I know you mentioned Schedule C, but what is it that qualifies uh, for example, myself, who is a sole practitioner, in, a able, in, uh, in an ability to apply for this PPP loan. So all you need to do is apply as self-employed, and now there is an option. So most of the banks, unfortunately, are not accepting applications for self-employed people and partnerships. So as of now, you can apply through PayPal, and their website is loanbuilder.com, okay. Square, QuickBooks, and Liberty SBF are still accepting applications. Those are online programs that you can apply to. So it's PayPal, loanbuilders.com, Square, QuickBooks, and Liberty SBF. For the Liberty, 
that's I'll the web underneath so everybody could follow through but yeah go ahead for sbf so the website is sbfpaycheck.com okay and i'll put those so that our viewers could definitely get to it and yeah, they could follow directions but here's the question with the original ppp loan the understanding was uh depending on the number of employees i have i'll calculate their payroll i will multiply it by two and a half and therefore i could expect and if i do get funding it's about that uh, extent how about for self-employed individuals what are they looking at so if you're a self-employed individual and you file form 1040 schedule c you qualify based on your net income so if you take your schedule c you need to look at line 31 net income you divide it by 12 just like you did with the payroll multiply this by two and a half and that is the loan amount you're eligible for as long as it doesn't exceed a hundred thousand okay. dollars so the same formula except okay. now your schedule c income is deemed payroll solely for the purposes of the ppp loan okay but if it does exceed the hundred thousand that means we'd be capped at a hundred thousand you're capped at a hundred thousand you just take a hundred thousand divided by 12 multiply by two and a half okay now with that said is uh do you believe that um the same forgiveness if applicable would apply to self-employees the llc's the business owners absolutely so the forgiveness is the formula is absolutely the same as 75 25 mm -hmm. so 75 percent of the ppp loan must be used for payroll costs except there's a different definition of payroll costs yeah and so i the, to ask you that what what's entailed or to the understanding and i know it's changing constantly what's entailed in the payroll cost so 75% must be used for payroll costs. So if you applied for a business that had wages, your payroll costs are regular payroll. And if you are self-employed or if you are a partner in a partnership LLC or LLP, then your payroll cost is based basically on your distribution. So if you take your distribution, if you are a partner in a partnership, or if you're a sole proprietorship, your net income from Schedule C, you divide it by 12, that's your monthly so-called payroll for the purposes of PPP loan. And that's the amount you have to pay yourself within eight weeks from the disbursement date. Now, good, good thing you mentioned the eight weeks of disbursement because I think a lot of people are concerned about this eight weeks period. And I wanna know more. Um, Initially, when this whole CARES Act and the funding came out, they said you can apply whenever you get it, then the eight weeks will kick in. But what we saw happening is people applied weeks ago and they're starting to get their money in. And once they get their money in, they are not able to start up right away because they've been out or they laid off or they you know for furloughed or they told their employees to wait to come back so i think one of the pressing questions i've been asked multiple times is that i'm a non-essential business i applied for the ppp loan i got it i don't know if the governor is letting me go back to work right now and so if i can't go back to work right now but i have to use this eight eight week period to pay my employees what do I do as a, from a business standpoint? Like what, what is somebody supposed to do? So as of today, the rule is still is the eight weeks from the date of disbursement. But because some of the states and in particular California has not reopened yet. So you just, some businesses cannot go back to work. Uh -huh. So the new, they're looking into the new regulations to expand the eight weeks period. So as of now, it's still eight weeks from the date of disbursement. Okay. But you have to, the idea is to restore your workforce pre-pandemic. But if you get the money now and you're still closed, obviously you cannot spend it on a payroll. Yeah. So those people should open a segregated bank account, deposit the PPP funds to that account, and wait for the updated regulations. Okay. Because some industry will, are still not open, some industry will open later. Right. 
So and we I, don't know if it's phase three or four. You're right. And we're across the country, we're opening at different stages. And some of these non-essential businesses, for example, a jewelry business who's manufacturing and selling to cruise lines in Miami, they're not operating because one, the cruise lines are not operating. Two, those businesses aren't operating. Three, they can't have their workers do diamond setting from home and open up stations that way. So they have to bring back their employees. And once they bring it back, they may, they're currently not considered essential. So Allah, what if, for example, if they were to go back in a few weeks, let's say in four weeks, and they got the funding this week, and for the first four weeks, they were unable to use the funds. But starting week five, six, seven, eight, they were able to use some of the payroll money. Uh, from a business practice point, or if you have knowledge about that, do you recommend them returning back the portion that's not used and asking waiver for the portion that is used to fall into the forgiveness plan? I recommend that they wait for now because I have a feeling we are due for the updated regulations because the treasury understands that hotels, airlines, beauty industry, they're not going to reopen anytime soon, gyms. So I am waiting for new regulations. Also, you need to rehire and restore the employees by June 30th of 2020. So, so I have a does that mean if I restore them June 29, start payroll right after that because I'm considered essential, maybe the regulations can speak to that. We don't know. Right. So for the businesses that are just getting the PPP funds and are not open yet, I recommend you keep it in a segregated bank account. And once we get more clearance from the treasury, we'll do an update. So for the businesses that are open, it's important to restore your workforce pre-pandemic and use the uh, funds for the eight weeks from the date of disbursements. If your business is still closed, keep the money in a segregated account because there are different credits available. And if we don't get more clear guidance from the treasury, then you can decide if you want to use this PPP loan or if you will implement a different tax credits. Okay. Without getting into detail, because I know how complicated and complex and convoluted it could be, but we've also heard that there, the fact that you do an employee retention, it actually may give you a tax credit or benefit. Now, I'm not asking you to go into detail, but would you recommend people instead of jumping and shooting off the hip to get the loan forgive, the, the, to request for the loan forgiveness, that they hang tight, wait to see what comes down, use the money for the payroll purposes that it was intended to, but collectively at the end of the year when they're filing their 2020 taxes, they look at it from a global scale to see, does it make, a, is it a better tax uh, benefit to uh, get the credits that the government is offering or to request forgiveness? Because my understanding is you cannot double dip and go into both, correct? Correct. You cannot double dip. So for the businesses that are open now or about to open, you should use the money within eight weeks. You should use the 75-25 rules and you should definitely apply for the forgiveness. For the businesses that are still not open, you should segregate the funds and you should wait for the clear guidance. And depending on what that is, you should really consult your tax accountant, CPA, or tax attorney on the guidelines. Because for some businesses that are still closed, it will be more beneficial to use the credit versus the forgiveness for the PPP loan. Okay. But some businesses are opening. So they need to understand that you do have, if you're open, or if you have employees working remotely, you need to use the 75-25 rule. You have to spend 75% on payroll costs, 25% on rent utilities, interest payment on mortgages, and apply for the forgiveness program because this forgiveness is more beneficial. Do we have a deadline as to when somebody must apply? Is it like the day after the funds run out, 10 weeks after the funds are given? Is there any guidance or we don't have anything yet? Uh, to apply for what? The forgiveness. For, uh, you will get, so if the bank gave, whichever bank gave you the loan, they will send you the application for forgiveness. The forgiveness application just recently came out in the beginning of May. Yeah. So for the payroll cost, if you 
got the PP loan based on payroll, it includes wages, tips up to $100,000. And a lot of people ask me, what about payroll taxes? Oh, my, that was my final question. What about payroll taxes? When there's state, there's federal, what's the understanding? So the payroll cost includes state and local payroll taxes, not federal. Okay. So the idea is that your employee gets the total gross amount. Oh. So you're not penalizing employees. But, you but it's only applicable for local and payroll if you cannot count for federal taxes. But you have the other 25%, which that's a business expense, and you can dip it in there. Absolutely. Okay. I want so to also payroll. I just, I'm sorry. I just want to mention that the payroll costs for self-employed people and partners in a partnership, they are calculated based on your 2019 net profit, either from Schedule C mm -hmm. or your K-1 distribution. Okay. So that's the payroll cost for the self-employed and the partners. Okay. And again, the message behind this segment is the fact that it is not, it, it was, it started with the PPP being for payroll and wages for um, businesses. However, if you're self-employed, you are a partner or you run an LLC or a partner of an LLP, you are able to get the, and apply for the PPP loan. Some of the links will be provided um, with the content of this uh, program. And you can go to Square, QuickBooks, um, PayPal, PayPal, and then Liberty, and Liberty SBF. Okay, and Liberty SBF. So I want to, um, you know, uh, definitely a lot of things are changing, regulations are changing. So hang tight and uh, let's see what comes down. And I know we'll provide um, some further programming once we have updates. Moving on. I want to mention one important thing related to PPP. So normally, if any loan is forgiven, it is still taxable under really weird provision of IRS for it, and it's called cancellation income. Okay. In this situation, if the loan is forgiven, it will not be taxable. And therefore, on a federal level, any expenses you paid with the PPP loan are not deductible. So that's what we were talking about, hanging tight and waiting to see which one is going to benefit you more, the deductions or getting the forgiveness, right? But if you already got the loan and you know it will be forgiven and you use your 75-25 rule and you pay the business expenses and it will be forgiven, the expenses that you paid with the PPP loan are not deductible. Because essentially, you're getting free money. You got the loan from the government. It's forgiven. It's not taxable income. Therefore, you're not deducting the expenses that you use, uh, that you paid using the PPP loan. So it's a basically a zero net result. However, for California, that loan, even if it's forgiven, will be included in income. But on the California level, you could use the expenses as the, that you pay, you, you can deduct the expenses. Okay. Wow. It's, a, it's, it's still a wash on a federal and state level. It just okay. goes on a different line of your tax return. I, I'm already confused. And this is why you go to professionals. And if you have a lot of tax planning or tax, you, uh, you go to the appropriate counsel or accountant to do all this for you. So I'm, uh, yeah, it, uh, taxes are like a wash. <laughs> So, look, I want to move on to the stimulus check under the CARES Act. And I know we had a lot of questions. I know it caused the havoc because here is the government saying, everybody gets free money and everybody's getting $1,200 if you qualify and $500 for the qualifying child, married couples $2,400. But then all of a sudden, here we are, May 21, about a month and a half into the CARES Act or almost two months into the CARES Act, and a lot of people haven't received their money. I know we're going to de deliver the message of them being patient, but I have this one pressing question. Is this free money? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is free money. So a lot of people ask me, what is it? And I tell them, consider it as a gift. It's a gift from the government. It's a stimulus payment, and it was meant for you to spend. 
Yeah, but here's the thing. If it's a gift, without getting into technicality and uh, individual circumstances, w the gifts usually are taxed on, correct? Or the giver gets taxed on the gift. Is uh, there... Gifts are not necessarily taxable. Okay, depend okay. So let's not even get into that. <laughs> we won't get into that. But do we have to report it on our um, income or do we report it anywhere on our uh, forms? No, this is not income. This is not taxable. And under no circumstances, you have to pay it back unless you receive the check for somebody who is deceased. I do want to touch upon that. So let's say a lot of people have not filed their 2019 taxes and the government based it off of 2018. In 2018, there was um, somebody who received the stimulus check, let's say a parent who passed away mid-year, end year, beginning of the year, but they were reported in their 2018 taxes. Not, they will not be reported in their 2019 taxes. So for that person or people who received the 1200 for the deceased, that has to be returned. You have to return the check, yes. So if you received it for somebody who is deceased, you just need to mail it back and to say the what? treasury. You put it in the mail, yes, and there are specific instructions. Okay. You have to, if you receive a check for $1,200 for somebody who is deceased, you write void on a check and you mail that voided check to the treasury. Don't okay. staple, don't bend it, don't clip it, just mail it. And include the note, disease, and put the date. Okay, and um, we'll provide as to where we will mail it in the, in the program guidelines, but here's the thing. Will they know? <laughs> <laughs> they do, because when you file, let's say somebody died in 2018. You have to file the last tax return for the decedent in the year that that person died. Okay. The person that had an estate will file a state tax return and the surviving spouse will show that there is a decedent. And there's also a decedent's last filed tax return. So they'll know. The okay. question is when the spouse gets the $2,400 check and it's a one check for two, so it was, and I've had a question of that and somebody did get a check and it wasn't a check. Let's say it was a direct deposit into their bank account, into the sole bank account, no longer the decedent's name, no longer joint tenancy of the $2,400. So what the surviving person should do is submit a personal check, money order, cashier check, to the appropriate IRS location. And I can provide the location Californians should send their payments to. Sure, that would On the check, you have to write US Treasury 2020 EIP. EIP, because of yes. economic, economic impact, impact payment. Mm -hmm. And the taxpayer's identification number, so that would be a social security number, okay. and include a brief explanation. Okay. And that check needs to be, so if you receive the check for 500, you put void and you mail back that particular check. And if you received it as a surviving spouse, you should write a check for $500 money order or whatever, and send it to the appropriate treasury location. Okay. So with that said, regarding stimulus check, I know millions of people are still waiting as of last week, 66 million people were not yet receiving their checks we are telling everybody to hang tight and i know you said um that the irs opened as of monday right yes and as a tax practitioner we're very excited because we have our own tax practitioners live uh -huh. so we don't need to wait for five hours to get somebody live yeah so and i know the irs website ha provides a lot of news releases and they said something uh along the lines that they're hiring about 3500 uh, reception is just to answer calls. Look, this is a new program. They didn't know what they were doing, but they did it and we're thankful for it. Now let's just be patient. A lot of people, depending on their income level and circumstances and however they're doing the hierarchy are moving up the change and, uh, chain and they will get their checks. It's just a matter of time. Any final comments regarding the stimulus check? Yes. Yeah, so if you go on the website and get my payment and you see payment status not available, 
it, all it means is that you have to wait until the payment is being issued. Okay. So you can check today and it says not available and then you'll check in three days and it will actually give you a date when it will be mailed. So this response does not mean you're not eligible. Right. You know the general criteria, the 75000 for um, the single person and 150 and then it gets reduced by 5%. So qualifying child, so everybody knows this rule. So if you have a valid social security you're within the guidelines in terms of gross income. You have a qualifying child under the age of 17. You will get the check. And the Treasury is issuing checks until the end of the year. And if you went on a non-filer site and you enter your information, the payment will generally be issued within two weeks from the date that you enter your information. So most people will get their checks. Okay. I also want to say that Again, this is not taxable and you don't need to return it. So if you qualified based on your 2019 income, okay. and let's say you made $75,000, you got your 1200 and in 2020, your income increased, you don't need to pay it back. Okay, but wait, if my income qualified me in 2018, but then my income was higher in 2019, you don't need to pay it back. Okay, and then it... it it went to the gutter in 2020. You don't need to pay it back. So but even if your income doubled in 2020, you okay. don't have to pay it back. A child being born in 2019, if they met the deadline of, I think it was last Wednesday, if they had input the information, they would have gotten their check with their lump sum or else they can get it for next year. But there's a caveat. If a child is born in 2020, it does the stimulus check apply to them in 2021? It doesn't. So if the child is born in 2019 and you're, you did not receive the $500 for that child, as long as it's a qualifying child, in 2020, you show that child, as long as it was born in 2019, or if you filed 2019 after you got your check, you will receive that $500 payment. Okay. However, if the child is born in 2020, that child is not eligible for $500 payment because the stimulus checks are designed, they're based on your information from either 2018 or 2019 tax returns. Do you think this will change? No. You don't think it will change? I don't think it will change. Because in 2020, the child is born technically after the fact. So they will not give you the stimulus 500, but certain people will qualify for different credit. There's still a child credit. Yeah. Uh, there's still an income credit. So there's, there's still different credits you can pay for the newborn, but oh. you're not going to get a $500. And the, the regulations are very clear on this issue. So if the child is born in 2020, they're not getting a stimulus check. Okay. But regarding stimulus, I know that a part of the word is also used with the $600 unemployment. Without getting into the details of unemployment, we know that people have been applying and millions of people applied in California and they, you know, if they got the max benefit of $450 a week and on top of it, they're getting the stimulus bonus of the $600 a week. Some people are under the misconception that the 600 is not taxable. So what, as a tax preparer, what is your um, input on that? Is the entire amount or a portion of the amount income and will it be taxed? My understanding is unemployment income was always taxable. So it's just your unemployment benefits and the unemployment benefits are taxable. It is taxable income. It has to be included in your tax return. Even if it comes from your federal government, it's still taxable. It's still taxable. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else with regards to stimulus checks or unemployment related um, to move on to taxes? My <laughs> Just remember that as of now, the tax deadlines have been moved. So oh. the taxes are due July 15. Okay. And if you need additional time to file tax return, you can file form 2848 for individuals and extend the filing deadline to October 15. Okay. And you can file form 7004 for businesses and extend it some business September 15, some October 15. Okay. Remember, the ex so as of now, the extended deadline is July 15 okay. with no penalties or interest accruing. Okay. However, if you need additional time to file after July 15, 
and you file an extension, this is an additional time to file, not to pay. So if you have a tax obligation and you don't pay it by July 15, you need to estimate your tax obligation for 2019 and pay. If you don't pay it, penalties and interest will start accruing from July 15. But that's true even if before the pandemic, right? So last year, if we wanted to file taxes by April 15, and if we wanted to get an extension, our obligation still became due on April 15, whether or not we paid it. And then we calculated what's really owed, if I, if I should get a credit or reimbursement or almost, right? Pretty much Correct. the rules apply, we just shifted the date. It's just a lot of people think that if they can extend filing deadline, they can somehow extend the payment deadline. Oh. That's never been the case. And the recommendation should be is if you can get to it, you have the time right now, just get it out of the way, do it. Um, and then, you know, at, at least you'll, you won't have something less. Do you think the business deadline will be extended or there's no discussion on that yet? The, it's, the business deadline has been extended too till July 15. So everybody... So the business individuals, what about the September, October filing for uh, corporations? For now, it's still July 15 plus the extension. So it's either September 15 or October 15. Okay. See, most of the states are opening up or so, except California. So I don't think that they will extend the deadline. But again, we don't know. Okay. But I will keep you updated if there is any updates on filing deadline extensions will post. That's awesome. Now taxes, and I know you deal with a lot of uh, people who owe the IRS. I think one of the biggest questions throughout this time, um, people, you know, rushing to the panic button of bankruptcy and having IRS debt. Now, one, a couple of questions on IRS debt. First and foremost, can you bankrupt IRS debt? Yes. Okay. So there are specific rules that I believe Karina touched base on your last program. Uh, but if there are certain rules you have to meet for the taxes to be dischargeable, it has to be three years old. Okay. It has to be due three years prior to the filing. And the taxes have been assessed 240 days prior to the bankruptcy filing. So what technically we're in 20... being assessed mean? When you file your tax return, let's say April 15, once the IRS processes your tax return, the taxes are being assumed, uh, assessed based on your tax return. So if you filed your return, you show you owe $10,000, you filed April 15, it's pretty much the date of your assessment, unless you're being audited. So if you're being audited, when the audit is complete, Upon completion of the audit and appeal, or you accept your liability, the assessment date will differ from the date of the filing. Okay. Okay. So it's three years rule plus the 240 days from the date of assessment. Also, if people that don't file taxes, there is no statute of limitations. So if you did not file taxes, there is no assessment date. You have to file, the taxes have to be assessed. And you have to wait. And you have to wait. Okay. So, so also for the bankruptcy purposes, if the IRS filed a lien against you, it's not dischargeable because we call it pre-petition lien. So you need to consult with the bankruptcy attorney to figure out if your taxes are dischargeable. But you also do... Um uh, for lack of better terms, and to dumb it down a little bit, lay, layman's terms, you do settlements with the IRS debt, correct? Yes, that's my passion. I've been doing it for 20 years. I love it. Okay. And every time I get a good settlement, I just yell and scream and my staff knows we settled <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, so talk to me about that. What is it? What, what does it mean to settle with an IRS, uh, with the IRS? And then when you settle, do you owe back money? Like, are you charged for the debt? Or <laughs> So I want to know a little bit more about that. So the settlement with the IRS is a little different, but in reality, it's like a debt settlement with your credit card. It just, it doesn't happen overnight. So we call it, the legal term is offering compromise. And this is an agreement between the taxpayer and the IRS. 
this is the program that allows you to sell or settle your tax liability for much less than you actually owe. And the ultimate goal is the compromise and what's in the best interest of the government and, our, and the taxpayer. So there are three different scenarios under which you can settle your IRS debt. Number one is doubt as to liability. You dispute your liability. Number two is the most common one is doubt as to collectability. Basically, you're saying, I don't have assets. I don't have enough income. What are you going to collect from me? Okay. And the third one, effective tax administration. Those are mostly for people that are disabled and um elderly so, so this is a different category are we talking about people who just have not paid their irs debt for years and years and years did they not get a lien on the house or garnished wages like how do you get in a bundle where they need to seek counseling and they need advice or representation i get into a lot of different scenarios of why people owe the most common people just don't care and don't file taxes. This, this is not filers. So it's a not filers. They just make millions of dollars and they never file until they get caught. We have a lot of people in California that are in a very interesting industry. It's all cash and they decide not to file. Okay. But what the IRS does, they assess taxes and they file what we call substituted tax return. So let's say I have a tax non file uh, taxpayer who never filed taxes and he calls me and says, oh, I owe $100,000. Did you file? No. Well, I don't owe them. Well, how do you know you don't owe if you never file? So the IRS has its own database and if you don't file for a year or two, they will file a substituted return for you that has no statute of limitations. So I cannot even settle your debt if you're a non-filer. So the first thing we do, we put them in compliance and we file taxes. And a lot of times you file them and the liability is minimal. Okay. But there's also people that file taxes and pay taxes, but they get audited. They get audited. They go through audit. Also, misconception, I can handle audit myself. I don't think so. You should really seek a you professional. Represent, you represent individuals who get audited, right? I do. Right. So my advice, hire somebody competent, CPA, uh, tax attorney, somebody who can help you navigate through audit. It's very complicated. And don't do it yourself because the IRS agent will take advantage of you. So, so the IRS agent has the ability to, uh, do they subpoena? Do they request the CPA to turn over records? They have. They, it depends, but the IRS has power to subpoena. They don't need to file a lawsuit. They okay. subpoena your bank statements. Okay. They subpoena your canceled checks. Okay. If you don't cooperate, if you do, most of the time they don't subpoena. Okay. And so if I've gone to a CPA or an enrolled agent or um, TurboTax and I've done it, they subpoena it. Uh, do, does the CPA or these agencies need to comply and turn over the material? Yes, because the privilege is a little different. Obviously, the strongest privilege is attorney-client privilege. So, but then if they come to a tax preparer, like an attorney who signs off on the taxes, there's a different layer of protection. There's a different layer of protection because they cannot subpoena my records. They need a court order. And then the client is protected by attorney-client privilege. There's much stronger. Well, I don't get in the situation. I've never been subpoenaed for my clients because if client comes to me for a tax audit, we don't get to the point of subpoena. We produce documents. And you show them. And I show them. We create work papers and we negotiate. We go into discussions. Look, tax audits is also negotiations, yeah. and lawyers use their skills. And I think tax attorneys are better equipped with negotiation skills than CPAs. And again, it depends on what type of audit. There are a lot of simple audits when I get um, clients to call me, and I refer them back to their CPA. If it's a regular Schedule C audit, they'll be better off for their CPA handling because CPA is knowledgeable. They prepare taxes, and I look at their audit what they're requesting and I will send it back to the CPA. Some audits are more complicated. Yeah, and 
Uh, some people are under the misconception that if a CPA signs off on their tax returns that they have no uh, liabilities, that you as an individual owe no liabilities. That's not true, right? That is not true. So as an individual, you are always liable for increase in taxes because you're ultimately the one who provided the information to your CPA or tax preparer and when the tax preparer files, prepares your taxes, you're the one reviewing them and signing them. The tax preparers, enroll agents, whoever prepares your tax returns, they are liable for penalties and interest mm -hmm. resulted in increase of tax liability, but only if it was due to their fault. Yeah. So if you're my client, the union provide me some information and I did not we're still supposed to do our diligence, but sometimes you just can't find out certain information. So there are certain things we will not be liable for, but in general, if the tax preparer made a mistake and that mistake resulted in an increased tax liability, that tax preparer will be liable for interest and penalty only. Mm -hmm. And you as a tax preparer is always on the hook for the increased liability. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it makes complete sense. You're never, you can't claim I didn't know. It was, I, you know, everybody has to hold their end of the bargain and be accountable for what they do. Exactly. So, any new um, taxes or any new news on taxes that you're anticipating, or are we pretty much up to date with everything that's happening? Well, up to date, everything was happening, but a lot of people coming out of COVID will not have ability to repay their liability for 2019. We don't know what 2020 will, um, how we're going to end the year. A lot of people have existing tax liability from prior years. Mm -hmm. So the offering compromise is a settlement for your total tax liability. So we don't do it year by year. It's the total tax liability for all the years that you owe. So as long as you file your tax returns, we combine your tax liability and if we pre-qualify you, and if you qualify, we submit the offering compromise. It takes six to nine months on average if your liability is less than $50,000. Nine to 12 months if it's over $50,000. And we negotiate. And as unfortunate as the circumstances are now, this is the best time to settle because the IRS agents are very sympathetic to the situation. I'll give you an example. I have a taxpayer who owes $264,000. He owes criminal restitution, which is not dischargeable in bankruptcy, and you cannot compromise it and he has to pay it in full. So prior to COVID, I've been negotiating the installment plan for this taxpayer for six months, and I could not move the agent from $4,000 a month. So just yesterday we settled it for, we, I put him on installment agreement for 12 months for $250 a month. Wow. Starting October 1st. Amazing. Between now and the 12th, so, first payment is due October, 12 months payment. So he technically has 16 months to start making payments. Yeah. Within that time, $64,000 will fall off his liability because the statute will expire. Because we have a statute of limitation like anything else in law. It's 10 years from the day they started collections. Oh, wow. And it, an installment agreement doesn't hold the statute. Okay, so here's another question. With regards to bankruptcy being reported on one's credit, is it the same when it's an IRS bankruptcy? Is so it falls under the same category, bankruptcy's bankruptcy? It's totally different. Bankruptcy goes on your record for 10 years. Uh -huh. The compromise, it's a private agreement between you and the IRS. But so, then you've been having negative reporting on your credit, right? From the IRS. Well, it's very tricky now. So before, IRS would put a lien. So IRS files the lien with the county recorder's office. Okay. And the lien attaches to all real and personal property that you own. 
The credit reporting changed last year, and don't quote me, I'm not an expert on credit repairs, but they need to have certain information to put it on your credit. Previously, before 2020, every single tax lien goes on your credit. The rules change a little, but even if it goes on your credit, if, it go, if you have a tax lien, it will not be dischargeable in bankruptcy, but we can still compromise it. So let's say you owe $100,000, and I settle it for $1,500. And yes, I've settled it and I have a lot of good stories. So I settled it for $1,500. We pay them $1,500. It's payable after you enter into the settlement within six months. And then after the last payment is made, the IRS releases the lien. Oh. So they send the letter to the credit bureaus if it ever was on your credit. And they, and they also record notice of release of lien with the county recorder's office when the original lien was recorded. Do you do this automatically or do you have to get involved until that stage and make sure that nobody's getting that reporting and the liens are released? I just check because once I negotiate a settlement, I make sure the client pays and the IRS is really good. They really file a notice of release of lien. I've not, I haven't had any cases when they did not file the release. That's amazing. Honestly, see, I didn't know about that. I knew people, you know, get audited, they owe money, but to be able to be in a position where you take hundreds and thousands of dollars and for lack of better term, say pennies to the dollar you settle versus bankrupted, depending on what situation the person qualifies that's amazing knowledge to know and have and only through a consultation or through talking to an attorney like yourself is when somebody's going to learn about that so before taking the burden on yourself and having that responsibility and accountability might as well just talk to an attorney and i think in all my programs i've been preaching that talk to us we're a consultation away give us a call we'll put you in touch with the people we know we always share uh not we we you know refer clients to one another all the time depending on what area of practice we know or we have and i think it's very important to know that um what Allah, anything else that you can think that our viewers may benefit from our program tonight if not, um, I know it's getting a little bit late. Hopefully we can do the live soon. Um, anything else to send a message to? For offer and compromise, have... yes. Sorry, you mentioned 50,000. I've heard, and I don't know if it's a myth or a fact, but some people say when you have a high IRS debt and 50,000 just kind of rang a bell. Is it true that the um, standards are the fact that I cannot renew my passport if there's a huge IRS debt that I've not uh, settled. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you owe more than $50,000 to the IRS, the law authorizes the IRS to certify that, that to the state department for an action. So they you will not renew, renew your passport and you're like, no, no, no. Your passport cannot be renewed. You owe an IRS debt. Correct. They will not renew your passport. And the beauty of the offer and compromise, once you settle it, it's considered settled. So even if you owe $100,000, regardless of the amount of the settlement, you settle it, it's done. After the settlement is done, your tax transcript will show zero liability. So the IRS will send the letter to the State Department. You can get your passport back. So what if I'm in the midst, uh, let's say the travel bans open up, what if I'm in the midst of flying international and I owe over $200,000? Is there a possibility me being held up? And is there any form of regulation or like a check and balance system? Is there something like that that, you, that you've heard of? Not that it's law or anything. So they, the IRS issued guidelines for revocation of passport. And I've had a lot of clients that were denied renewals. I have not had anybody that the passport was revoked. But I guarantee you, if you owe more than $100,000, it'd be revoked by the federal. What the state does, they revoke your driver's license. They what? revoke your professional license. They put you on the, what I call it the shit list of people that owe taxes and they publish the list. And the Franchise Tax Board has an ability to revoke your professional license. Mm -hmm. I just recently had an attorney who was facing um, actions by, 
she was facing her legal license be revoked. Okay, wait a minute. Do they notify you though? They do. They do. It's just okay. a lot of people tend to ignore the notices. So please, the worst thing you can do is just to look at the IRS or FTB notice and just throw it out. This is the worst thing you can do. It's better to have the knowledge and consult with the professional. There's a lot of programs available, offering compromise. We have installment agreement. People that, especially in today's world, there is a non-collectible status available. If you cannot afford payments, even the monthly payments will put you on non-collectible status for a year. Nobody will come after you. It's just the worst thing if you just don't do anything. So, but is there anything that's in law or in place right now that we cannot travel if we owe or any discussions that there was going to be, or we don't know yet and it's too new, but it's something that they're going to look into? There were discussions that they will, um, Starting 20, 2021 or 22, they wanted to stop ability to travel, period, for anybody who owes over a certain amount of money. But I think it was prior to COVID and Treasury is busy with uh, everything else that is going on. So but after it's all over, money. I'm sure we'll have new guidelines. So when they scan our passport right at that checkpoint, they're going to be yes. like, no, 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 you cannot go. You, owe, you have something on your name or you owe IRS. It's going to be embarrassing <laughs> to travel. I know, I know. And I, I'm urging people, consult somebody. Uh, you consult tax attorney, uh, tax practitioner, your CPA, somebody to help you get out of debt. This is worse than having a credit card debt. It is. It definitely is. Of course, this is your, I mean, your passport is your identity for, you know, people fight for their passports. They die for their passports and they're not. I know. But I know I could see why the IRS and the government would want to put a ban because if, I mean, a hundred thousand is may not be much, but there are people who owe a lot more and they just want to bounce to Geneva and call it. I a know. <laughs> or Croatia or wherever they want to go. Allah, what languages do you speak? So I personally speak English, Russian, and Ukrainian, and um, I also have staff that speak Spanish. Very nice. And your practices mainly and heavily are the tax planning, the asset protection, with the you know experience and the knowledge you bring in with bankruptcy and uh, estate planning. Correct. So you are like an umbrella go-to firm where you know you get from A through Z, and that's wonderful. And I wanna thank you so much for coming on to tonight's program and joining me and giving us this much insight. When we have questions, I'm gonna reach out to you and then we'll provide maybe content together. I look forward to having another program with you, maybe honing into a, you know, when maybe new regulations come down and we can provide people more guidance talking about that. With that said, I wanna thank you for tonight and I hope you do well. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for having me.